Praise Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Thank you for coming down uh, this evening for the talk. Uh, it's entitled Jang Hind Punjab. Uh, and uh, just as um, just Deepang Singh has said, it's the first part of a, a two part talk. So this week I'm going to be covering the kind of preamble to build up 284, um, just to provide a bit of context um, to what it took place uh, in Jalasi. So we'll start from partition. And we'll look at uh, the partition of Punjab and the Punjabi super movement that followed. And then we'll continue with um, what I term this Indo Sikh confrontation, um, which kind of continues for the decades that, uh, that predate 84. And then today we'll end with Darbi al Morja, so we're up to 84. And the next week we'll pick up from the actual battle itself, the aftermath, and the Sikh genocide, and then the declaration for Khalistan that came in 1986. So, like I said, what, in 1947, it's, it's the dawn of, of the Indo-Sikh confrontation. So we heard from Bhai just deep Singh a few weeks ago about the zone that the Sikh underwent in, in the 18th century from, the, from the, the Delhi throne of the Mughals. Yeah, um, we've just recently commemorated 100 years since the Delhi Awalabad massacre under the British. So what we see now in 47 is this new era of subjugation that takes place across Punjab from the Indian state, and it does begin in 47. So the Vishwara that happens, it's literally a split of Punjab. You have Lahore, which was the capital of the Bali Khalsa under Ranjit Singh, which falls to modern day Pakistan. And then you have the Bar Sarvakal Takht and the other Gurdwari uh, that go to East Punjab. It's, um, it's, it's up to 40% mass displacement of the Sikh. Uh, and the conservative figures say that uh, two million uh, people died as a result of that. Um, but actually, that is, a, that is a conservative figure. So straight away from '47, we're the ones who you know uh, suffer the most. Um, there's also the partition of Bengal as well. But for the purposes of today, we're going to be concentrating on Punjab. Um, I just wanted to just briefly touch upon what was being said to the Sikh prior to '47. So from the likes of the would-be leaders of like the Gandhi, uh, like Gandhi and, and Nehru. So they were saying things like, apologies, it's a little small on the screen there, I hope you can read it. They were trying to politic the Sikh and they're trying to uh, you know, appease them uh, and get them on side because they understood that the Sikh had ruled Punjab prior to 47. So in many ways, the Sikh were gonna be the, the main threat to their rule that was gonna take place um, in Punjab following 47. So this is uh, Nehru in 46, just a couple of, just a year or so before. And he says, I see nothing wrong in, in an area set up in the north of India uh, where the Sikhs can also experience a global freedom. Uh, he says that you know, they're entitled to, to special consideration. And this has been done years before 47. This is uh, Mohandas Gandhi, uh, and he says a similar sort of thing. I ask that you accept my word and the resolution of the Congress that it will not betray a single individual, much less an entire uh, community. And if it does so, it will hasten its, uh, its own doom. And this was said in 1929, so you can see that's uh, quite a, almost 20 years before. So it kind of begins way before 47. Um, he also says things like, you know, there's, there will be no constitution that will be acceptable, acceptable to Congress, uh, which did not satisfy the Sikh. What happens in 47 is um, they, there's a massive U-turn on that. So when, when the constitution is made, it's very anti-Sikh and it's very anti-minority. So all of these, all these pledges and, and assurances that they made prior to 47 are just thrown out the window. So let's look at, at that. Look at the date there, the 10th of October, so two or three months after partition happens. This is the governor of East Punjab saying the Sikhs as a community are a lawless people and are thus a menace to the law-abiding Hindus in, in the province. Hence, they should be stringently suppressed. So you see now the, the kind of how they changed uh, their views on the Sikh and, and how they how they view us. And like I said, the constitution itself, when it comes out, is is, is very um, anti-Sikh. So what we see then is over the next kind of uh, two decades, um, there's there's mass scale suppression and subjugation that takes place across Punjab. Um, and there's two things I want to speak about specifically, and that was um, the river water um, allocation that takes place and the denial of the Punjabi language. Now, in the 50s, uh, well, when, when Punjab was split, the East Punjab was given a certain allotment of the, of the river water that, that runs through the, the, the large Punjab. 
in the, in the mid 50s, Rajasthan was given 50% of Punjab's share of that water. And Rajasthan being a non riparian state. Um, and the sick, obviously, they're opposed to it because we all know that agriculture is the main industry in Punjab. You know, it's, it's going to affect the economic stability of Punjab and, and the people, and it's going to affect their ability to earn an income. Language is also denied. So every other Hindu state within India is recognized on linguistic grounds. But Punjab is made an exception. So what they're trying to do is that they, they try to force Hindi as the official language of Punjab. I just wanted to bring up a couple of papers uh, from this, but from the UK. So this was written in the Scotsman in 1950. Um, and I have copies of these, so I can circulate these afterwards. The Gali Dal, they were the, the Indian political party set up to uh, supposedly represent the Sikh. So it says here that the Gali Dals want nothing less than an autonomous Punjabi speaking state carved out the Punjab and a few states to the east. It is to be subjected to the Indian Union only in matters of defence, foreign affairs and communications. As was promised by the Indians prior to 47, they said that the, the Punjab would, would um, be semi-autonomous and we, there wouldn't be any infringements from the centre. Um, so as a result of what actually happens, um, the fact that they lied, they lied about that, they're sick and opposed, and this is what was being written in the press here in this country. Uh, another quote from that article is, uh, it, the Indian government, says special concessions cannot be made to local minorities. The Sikh must be Indians first and, and uh, Sikhs afterwards. So you see how they've changed in their attitude towards the Sikh just within, uh, within a decade. I mean, it hasn't even been uh, 10 years since partition, but this is what is now being said. Uh, and this is what's being reported here uh, in, in the UK. What happens is, as, as a result of the actual um, resistance from the Sikh, um, the, the Indian government and, and the police, they come down quite heavy on the Sikh. So, what, can anybody tell me what, what that looks, what looks like it is? Well, the one on the right even. Um, no, 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 now, these pictures were all taken in 1955. Um, so what happened was volunteers, the Sikh had gathered um, at the bar site to, volunt to voluntarily court arrest in opposition to what the Indian government at the time was doing to Punjab with the river waters, with the language, and the fact that it was just suppressing the people of Punjab. The police then invade the bar site. That picture on the left there, that's a youth who was injured and his arm is then plastered up. On his t-shirt you can see it says Punjabi Suba. Um, and just in the Punjabi, it refers to the fact that he was injured in the actual protests. Down the bottom there, that's, that's uh, Guru Ram Das, uh, Langar Hall. The one on the, in the, at the bottom in the middle, you could just about make out, but that's troops. This is 1955, 30 years before what happens in 84, uh, and so on and so forth. Gitan is stopped, um, and the police establish themselves uh, in charge for four, for four whole days. Um, and they invade the Pagarma, they also fear they also fire tear gas uh, at the at the Sikh Sangat as well. And you can see the knocking down walls. In the in the distance across the Sarovar, you can see the buildings there have been damaged um, as well. Hundreds of Sikh were humiliated, beaten, arrest, uh, arrested. And this included several hundred Bibia that were that formed part of the Jatta that was there to um, oppose them as well. And what they do as as a show of power, they raise the Indian flag within the bar side and outside in the streets. Now you would only do that again if you deemed that that uh, institution, that place, a threat to your sovereign rule. There's something important to bear in mind as we go forward with these slides. So again, just to give some context, this has been written now in 1955 here again in, in the UK. Uh, this is the Telegraph. Sikhs campaign for an independent state. So this is already happening in the 50s. Just some quotes. Um, I want you to pay attention to the terminology that the reporters are using here and compare that to what you've read to the reports that have come out since the 80s and, and the propaganda. So the proud and fearless Sikhs of India, backed by their centuries old tradition of warfare, are pushing a campaign for an independent state along the rugged northwest frontier. Tall, bearded, warlike, the picturesque Sikhs were a state of their own. 
and they go on to say 10,000 Akalis in blue turbans and with orange scarves uh, wound close, uh, loosely around their necks, volunteer, uh, volunteers for the Civil Disobedience Campaign. So you can see the sheer number of, of six Sangha that were actually there protesting what the Indian government was doing in, in the 1950s. And actually that was the, the Coventry Evening Telegraph. Police invaded the sacred Golden Temple and were sho and showered with bricks, so they replied with tear gas bombs. As I said, they cordoned off the temple um, and hundreds were arrested. This last quote, independent, courageous, persistent and fearless all describe the Sikhs. The chances are good that they will one day achieve a home of their own. So this is what's been reported here uh, in the UK at the time. So okay, this is all being done because of what the Indian state was doing with the subjugation and the fact that it was uh, denied Punjabi as the official language of Punjab, whereas the other states um, had been given that right. So what happens? Well, Punjabi is eventually recognized as the official language in 1966, but it comes at a huge cost. What they actually end up doing is, so this map is a really good illustration of what takes place in Punjab. So that kind of lighter green area in the middle, that was Punjab under Maharaja Ranjit Singh and, and the territory that he laid claim to. Then where it says that kind of white area, all of it, that was then um, the, what happens in, in, in 1966. Just to the right of that, you see a, a little kind of light green area. And this big one, yeah. So this area here, all of this, that was 1947. Then after they create um, two new states of Himachal up here and Haryana down here, Punjab is then reduced to a mere fraction of its former self in 1966. So they do give the Punjabi language its, its prominence, but only at the cost of further splitting Punjab up. So naturally, as a result of what, what's happening there, the Sikhs continue with their uh, opposition to um, the policies that the Indian government are deploying uh, within Punjab. Um, Chandigarh has made um, Union territory, so the, Punjabs are denied, the Punjabis are denied, the Sikhs are denied a capital city, uh, as well as other Punjabi-speaking regions. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to speak about Shaheed Darshan Singh Feruman. Darshan Singh Feruman was a stern anti-colonialist during the British occupation of Punjab. So in the 1920s, he took part in the Gurdwara reform movement. Uh, he led the uh, Morche in Jetoda Morcha. So he, he was uh, on the front line fighting to get rid of the, of the British. He sees what's happening in Punjab and, and he then joins the Sikh the, uh, under the Gali Dal to basically um, stand up and, and resist what, what the Indians are doing. What actually happens is he picks up a hunger strike which another Sikh had, had stopped. So what happened was he had, Sant Fateh Singh had done an Ardas that he would um, do a, a hunger strike till death uh, unless the, the issues, the outstanding issues in Punjab were resolved. He, what happens was Indira Gandhi approached him and uh, she said, look, we'll, we'll resolve it, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll sit down and we'll, we'll resolve the issues. So he, Oman Jandaya, so he, basically stops his hunger strike. And Darshan Singh Feriman comes in and says, no, this is wrong because you did an Ardas, and as we all know, for a Sikh, the Ardas is the, the highest thing that we can do. So he then picks up the Morcha. So primarily, to obviously, again, to resist what the, what the Indians are doing in Punjab, but also to, to um, for the sanctity and, and the dignity of opposing Ardas. And he then eventually, on the 74th day uh, of his hunger strike, he then um, passes on as well. But the reason why I wanted to speak about him was because this was someone who was fighting against the British to free India at the time. Uh, and then when he stands up for the rights of Punjab afterwards, they pay no attention to what he's doing. They complete disregard and complete disrespect um, of the Sikh. It shows you how much they valued the actual contribution the Sikh made prior to 1947. So this is kind of... So as a result of all of the, issue, the outstanding issues, the Akali Dal, they create a document called the Anandpur Sahib Resolution in 1973. Uh, it's drafted by um, Sardar Kapoor Singh, and it, it's, a, it's a key position document outlining all of the outstanding issues, the river water that's been diverted, the Punjabi language, uh, the fact that Punjab doesn't, is not, you know, doesn't have any sense of autonomy, and it's not a federal setup. All of these issues are then outlined. So now it kind of comes as it comes, now we're coming to the kind of 70s, um, and this is now getting closer to obviously what happens in 84. 
1975, uh, Indira Gandhi, she's found guilty of election fraud. Um, and to save herself from the repercussions of that, she declares a state of emergency across India. And this lasts for almost two years. Um, she throws anyone, in, in, anyone who opposes her into jail. According to Amnesty International, 140,000 oppo um, opponents are thrown into um, jail without trial. So completely unconstitutional, complete miscarriage um, of, of, of justice. Some have quoted 40,000, some 50, some 60,000 um, that, that were sick of the 140,000 figure. Because we're already, we're already um, campaigning and protesting the government for what's doing in Punjab, and then when we see what she's doing, uh, she, effectively she rules as a, as, a, uh, as a dictator, she rules by decree. Parliament is, a, is, is, um, is dissolved. Again, mass protests and agitation that kind of continues on from what they were doing in the, in the, in the previous years. And there's also opposition that comes in from Sam Kartar Singh Ji, Paul Sapindavale, who was the Jatadar of the Nabla Mijak Sahar before uh, Sam Jagnal Singh Ji. And there's an incident that takes place in December of that year. So what they have done is they've, they've called a gathering to commemorate the 300 uh, Shahidi Devas of Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji. And Indra Gandhi is there as well. And she speaks from stage uh, and she says things like, Again, she's she's trying to you know uh, appease the sick. So she says things like the same Delhi throne that once beheaded um, Gurudev Bahadurji is now here paying reverence and, and here to respect um, a couple of of her own people and speak as well. Again, uh, trying to you know to play on sick sentiment and draw the attention of the sick away from what the actual what the centre is actually doing in, in Punjab. Sant Kartar Singh then speaks and he, and he calls her out. And he says, you know, he says things like, "It doesn't matter how powerful she might think she is. No one for the Sikh is greater than, than the actual Guru." And and the Sikh only bow down to Guru Granth Sahib Ji, and uh, only recognize the sovereignty of the Guru Khalsa Pant. And as soon as and when he says when he makes his speech, uh, all those that are gathered, there's Jakari that heard from across the Divan. So she, you know, this this um, it doesn't settle well with them because she understands that actually the Sikh are still have that connection to the Guru. Um, and they are also going to oppose her, her unjust uh, rule. So what does she do? The following year, the attacks continue in Punjab. So when I, when I said earlier that the two new states that have been created, Haryana and Himachal, she issues an executive order for, for a further 50% of Punjab's river water to be diverted um, to Haryana, and Delhi also takes them as well. So Punjab is then left with 75%, uh, sorry, left with 25% of what it was originally allocated following 1947. And again, like I said before, it, it has a massive effect on the livelihood of the Sikh of Punjab. Outside of farming and agriculture for, for the Sikh of Punjab, you know, joining the armed forces, they, they've got a great tradition of being you know, a martial race, uh, a martial people, so they would, um, they also place a restriction on that. So Sikh enlistment into the army is uh, put down to just 2%. So unemployment rates soar through the roof in Punjab. In addition to that, there's then also the introduction of the drugs and the alcohol and the pornography. You know, other states, there's a ban on alcohol, in like places like Gujarat and Manipur. And that, that ban stays in place until the mid-90s, but Punjab, they don't really do that. In fact, they open up more club beer and, 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 and alcohol is just allowed to, to um, flow in. There's no investment in education. There's no investment in any of the infrastructure. And the third thing she does is she helps prop up anti-Sikh cultist groups. So the likes of the Nirankari, headed by Gurbachana, and he's given a diplomatic passport, he's given free reigns to come and go as he pleases in Punjab uh, with full funding and support. And they also have um, a, an interest in the Punjabi uh, administrative centre as well, so they've got influence there. And this guy, he's really bad news for the Sikh because He's been around for a few years, but now he's getting you know, mass support from the government. And the biyadri that's taking place during this time, things like, you know, he, he claims to be greater than the Guru. He, they try to twist Gurbani. He places his feet on Guru Granth Sahib Ji Maharaj. Uh, he says things like, Guru Hargobin Sahib Bacha uh, released 52 political prisoners. I'm greater than him because I've released 63. And then what they're doing is they're, they're planning a massive uh, gathering for the 13th of April, 1978 which has become known uh, as the Nirgari Saka. And at that gathering, that he's going to be presenting his Sat Satare. Now his Sat Satare are, are what he deems to be the equivalent of the Panch Piyari that Guru Gobind Singh created. 
So you see, it's a direct challenge to the ideology of the Guru and to our Itihas uh, and, and our Siddhant. So the Sikh are obviously not going to stand for this. So Santu Nelsonji, who is now the leader of the Dhamma Riksal, he organizes a Jatva of Sikh to go to oppose um, the Nilkaris. So a group of 100, a Khan, Keith, and Jatha, and uh, Riksal get together. But as soon as they arrive at the assembly of the Nilkaris, they're, they're shot at. And the Nilkari government, as well as the police who are colluding with them, they shoot at them. And this is where we see the Shahidi of the 13 uh, in 1978, uh, including by Fort Justin, who, who was leading the Morsha. And the picture on the bottom there is the Yantim Sanskar, um, led by something else. In so this, in many ways, for me, is kind of a turning point um, that we see, despite the fact that the Sikh have been resisting since 47, and despite the fact that the Barstam has already been invaded, this now, and there were other incidents as well in that year, in Kanpur, in September, and in Delhi as well, were again, indiscriminate firing and sick again. And you've got to remember, at this stage, they were there peacefully protesting, and they were shot, they were shot upon. Uh, following this, the Hukum Nama is issued from the Akal Takht, where it basically forbids any Sikh of the Guru from associating themselves with the Nirkaris. And this is now when we see um, the rise of, uh, of Sant Jirnal Singh Ji. I put this in, but I wanted to skip this. This is basically just some of the, well, it's the 12 resolutions of the Nampasa resolution, which the Akali that at this stage now formally adopt. Um, so they, they still continue with their um, protests, uh, you know, the, the, despite the fact that Sikh have been, have been shot at and killed, um, they continue that. But just to give, gives you an idea of, you know, what the Sikh were asking, you see, in number five, for example, the immediate rehabilitation of Kashmir refugees. So the Sikh, this idea of Sabbat they weren't just asking for their own rights to be recognized, but they were also at the same time asking for the protection of other minority um, communities. So in 1978, following the Nilankari Saka, there's a, a, a massive meeting called. Um, and the meeting is attended by most of the main leaders of Punjab, so the likes of Longawal, Dora, Badal is there, anyone who's a, who's a Pardan of a, of a Gurdwara, they're there as well. Um, and Sam Nelson as well uh, is there, even though he's not, not much is known about him at this stage because, like I said, he's just become the Jatadag, quite young as well. Uh, and what they may see, what the what the others are, are discussing is how they're now going to resolve the issue in Punjab. So it's but again they kind of put forward ideas that they've already exhausted. So they want to try and speak with the government. They're going to try and go through the courts. Um, these are the kind of things that are being suggested. Um, and then what happens is, and Hang Singh he, he takes the the, the mic, and uh, he says uh, that you know there used to be a time in the month when the Jatada would give the order and the Sikhs would go and take his head off for what he's done. And we heard again from just, uh, by just deep a few weeks ago of Sukhra Singh Mehtab Singh and what they did with Masalanga. So he, you know, he's trying to bring back that idea of, of what the Khalsa were, were about, you know, our tradition, our, our parampara. Uh, after he speaks, uh, someone else from the Akali Dal, I think it's a, a BP, she speaks and she tries to kind of downplay what he's, what he's just said and she says that we've, we've got to uh, remain level-headed um, some George not horse read up and she says these kind of things. And after she speaks, Santi stands up and he comes forward and, and he speaks. And again, like I said, no one no one really knows who he is, but you know where he's come from. They know that he's from the Tuxal, um, but this is really his kind of his kind of first appearance. And uh, he says, he goes, I want to ask the, the Bibi who just spoke that did Guru Gobind Singh not have a horse when he had all the battles with the Mughals? Did Bandar Singh Bahad not have any horse? Uh, when he took on the Mughal Sarkar and, as, and, he, and he started an armed res, uh, resistance movement. And again, he's, he makes the same points uh, to, to kind of reiterate what, what the Nahang was saying. Uh, and then he, say, then he concludes by saying that I'm not just the of the Pant, I'm just a donkey, I'm just a servant of the Pant, but when you guys have tried your methods and they fail, come to me, I'll give the order, you can go take his head off. Two years later, that's exactly what happens. Gurbatan is assassinated by, uh, by Ranjit Singh, who goes on to become the Jatada of the Akal Takht. And like I said, now this is where we see the, the mobilization of the Sikh. So Santi Nelson he starts his big pink prachar, and there's a real awakening taking place uh, across the villages of Punjab. It's something Santi, for those of you who have seen his, his speeches and, and, or read, uh, read them in the book, he's very clear. My mission is to administer Amrit 
to explain the meaning of Gurbani and to teach Gurbani to those around me. That a Hindu should be a true Hindu, a Muslim should be a true Muslim, and a Sikh should be a true Sikh. And wherever Santri went, uh, wherever he spoke, he, you know, there's three or four main things that you'll see from his speeches. Nashe Shardo, Bani Paro, Amrta Shakum, Shastar Tari Mano, Anandpur Kari Bajo. He was very direct and he was speaking to, to, to specific to the Sikh and he's realigning them with um, Gurmani and Gurmat, Gurmat ideology. He wasn't saying let's go and protest or let's go and try and take it to the courts. This was about Aapan Hati Aapan Aapan That's what he would say in, in his speeches. So he then starts the Tarmiyad Morcha, uh, which is again the mass mobilization. So it begins with Jatheo 50. It grows to 300, and then within months, it's 30,000 Sikh who are again uh, courting arrest. Um, but it's different, you see, from actually seeking uh, them to resolve the issues by trying to go through the courts. This is the Sikh asking for the release of the political prisoners. Um, he's asking for Amritsar to be recognized as a holy city. And he says that these are my basic demands. Uh, and the, the Akalis, they, the Akalis at this time, they kind of see how much. Um, uh, how Punjab is awakening and how popular Santan Singh is now come, becoming. So they then, um, in July 2, they then joined their Morcha that they had started uh, with the, the Tarimid Morcha. All the while, the indiscriminate firing, that, that continues as well. So the Vyadvi is still taking place, Sikh are still being sh uh, shot at, but now what we're seeing is that Santan Singh is now readying the Sikh. Like I said, that, that, that was uh, him speaking about the, the basic demands that, that he has. And this is, um, this is in 1983. And, and wherever he goes, and he, he says things like, he, he always brings in our um, Tehas and you know, the Surah that we will recognize. Um, you know, he says things like, if Sukha Singh and Metab Singh had come to fight a suit in order to catch Masaranga, he would never have been called. He says things like Baba Deep Singh had sought writs from the courts, the Afghani flag would never have come down from her mother's side. If Banda Singh Bahadur uh, had uh, consulted with uh, commissioners and lawyers, Wazir Khan would never have been called. So he, he's raising, uh, he's um, letting them know that they are enslaved within India. And he says, that doesn't mean to speak, he says that Sikhatik Gulamiya, Gulami Naniya. So whereas before the, the Gali Morta was about this is discrimination, this is great injustice, he says no straight up this is enslavement and it's been that way since 1947. I wanted to kind of end on this because obviously we'll, we'll pick up um, the actual back himself next week, um, but this is something he says um, a year before, a year or so before the attack. If they pick up the courage to dis desecrate on the other side, do not worry that they might carry me away. They will not take me alive. If they take me dead, never mind, because what can I do after? What can I do for you after I'm dead? Anyone who tries to take me alive will come. Will have to come prepared. He will bring some vehicles along. Just watch how he put them on trains back to Delhi. That's what he was. Something else, So that's um, that's why I had this evening, just to give you, like I said, some context, some background, and it wasn't just about '84. This was. Uh, subjugation for decades. You know, we hear about people commenting how um, it took them 18 months to plan the attack. They had a replica made in the, the Doon Valley. It might have taken them 18 months to plan the attack, but the Indo-Sikh confrontation was ongoing for the past 30 years. So I'll leave it there. Uh, we'll open the panel. We'll open the floor to questions. Uh, I know I have, I've seen some of the questions that are coming. I know some of them probably relate to next week's talk, but we can we can address them. Um, as well. Thank you for listening. Why did you call Salah? Why did you keep on there?